Awesome vegan shitty party, awesome vegan shitty party, awesome vegan shitty con county preparation for four people get one and the exactly. drama. I'm gonna have, if you do come back, we're gonna have to meet up because we we sort of were planning on one, but I was, I was uh, busy and had some party shit. So we're gonna have to meet up. Yeah, and, and I was like a flyby. Make a make a um, yeah, a similar little video. And it's been quite nice. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rollins, for those who don't know, Rollins is in New York. And met up with uh, Foxy Jazabelle and one or two other people, and photo bombed Trevor Noah, which is quite cool. I'm, he's definitely getting ahead in like actually meeting people from the YouTube community in real life race really fast, bastard. Yeah, because he's met everyone, hasn't he? Now, basically. Yeah. So yes, I'll have to come. He hasn't met me. Well, I'm thinking about coming up for the fringe. I'll... Oh, okay, okay. Well, I'll have to. Um... I'll have to make sure I never meet Rollins just to give you a chance at the roast. <laughs> yeah, I do oh, that. Look, he'll turn up at my door and I'll just I'll just not answer. Fuck him. <laughs> he's from he's from the wrong way. He's he's an upside down person. I don't want these people around me. Well, Please actually, know. one of the, we are concerned about the fact that the government's not going to be very stable and could we could very well be back in the field before the end of the year. And so, what one of the things we're planning on doing is turning around. The recordings from the transcripts as soon as possible and doing an ebook on basically what people thought and were saying during the run-up to the election and afterwards and mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be kind of a, a mix of there's a book out called sex lies in the ballot box which is 50 chapters but every entry is only like 1500 words long and so we're going to kind of do it thematically like perceptions of may perceptions of corbin perceptions of tim farron um ukip snp uh, applied Cymru. And then also go deeper and to take particular people, uh, like some of uh, one of our participants who voted UKIP last time, and she's very opinionated and a real strong personality. And we were really fascinated to see, because when we got in contact with her for this study, she wouldn't identify with any political party. Right. And what she ended up doing was spoiling her ballot, because she wanted to express something, but she didn't have the option out of the above really frustrated with where the government's going, and she just couldn't support any of the parties. Um, and she's like, a, to me, a really fascinating kind of angry voter that maybe we don't hear a lot from in the surveys. And so, you know, kind of looking in on her perspective and what she had to say um, would be also, you know, maybe one of the people featured in the book. So we'll write it on spec and then put it out as an ebook and then yeah. shop it around to publishers. Yeah, I, I, well, as you say, you're going to have to have a quick turnaround because potentially it could be all, all over soon. Um, one of the one of the best jokes because they had the bit where all the new, all the people who were re-elected and the new MPs and all that they have to go there and swear an oath of allegiance and they have to so look at the, the formal kind of signing the you know to become MPs thing um, the parties has like a speech in Parliament and it's all, it was all a bit of fun and actually fair play to Theresa May because they re-elected Perko as the Speaker of the Parliament right. and she actually made quite a good joke she said and he was elected unopposed and no one voted against him so um, uh, she said at least someone got a landslide, which is quite a risque joke because there's a lot of Tory MPs behind her thinking, you nearly cost me my fucking job, you bitch. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Um, so there's that. Um, and that's that, but a lot of them thinking, well, you cost my friend their, their seat, yeah. you know, and all this. But anyway, but anyway. Um, so that all happened. Um, and Tim Farron, who's now stood down as the Lib Dem leader, but anyway. Right. Uh, thankfully, the homophobic prick, but anyway, he, he stood up and gave his speech. And one of the things was he told he told us a crap joke about the wigs or something, and um, he said uh, and uh, people groaned and he went, "Oh, don't worry, I'm here all week." And one of the responses from one of his own MPs was, "If the Parliament lasts a week," which is quite nice. <laughs> um, yeah, which is I mean I think that gives you a fair idea of most of the people in part, and the, obviously they laughed. And you think, well, I think people know this isn't this this is not really even a serious Parliament, is it? No one thinks this is going to last. No. And that's understandable because it's built on the shakiest ground. I mean, it really is the biggest political irony that could have happened out of this election. But they run on strong and stable and end up least strong and stable government, fucking coalition government, which was only in power, you know, two years, well, just over two years ago. And that was mm. actually relative. That, that was incredibly stable considering it was a coalition. Whereas this thing just looks like a train wreck. From the very start, you know. 
there's also the whole issue of whether or not they can really even go into co coalition with the DUP, given the Good Friday Agreement and the fact that the DUP is one of the people negotiating, you know, and trying to form a government in Belfast. And yeah. the Great well, Britain is well, meant to be a neutral partner. And you can't be a neutral partner when you're depending on one of the people negotiating, you know, who has a vested interest in the outcome in Northern Ireland. You're depending on them for votes. Yes, well, there's a couple of things uh, to mention on that. Firstly, it's, uh, just just for clarity, it's not actually an official uh, coalition. It's a it's called confidence and supply vote. Uh, which, yes, which basically means yeah, which basically means per vote in Parliament, uh, they go to the DUP, negotiate what the law is going to be, and the DUP say yeah, and then they basically give them those ten votes. They go through the lobbies for the Tories. Um, but that's on a per vote basis. They're not actually in coalition, so the DUP won't be in government as such. Just to clarify, but yeah, I mean, even so, to have an informal coalition, as it were, with the DUP potentially actually breaks the law. Well, to breaks the Good Friday Agreement because, like you said, they're supposed to be an impartial um, uh, partner in Northern Ireland. Although technically, they can't ever really be an impartial advisor because right. they are still technically the power there. Like in right. theory, the British government could just send troops there, and you know the troubles start off, all off again, uh, and that might actually end up partially being a, a potential problem because Sinn Fein, who are the essentially the the yin to the DUP's yang in Northern Ireland, um, Jerry Adams, uh, the president of that party, went to Downing Street for talks. As it, I mean, that's sort of typical that will happen. Um, that's and a unionist came out side. The um uh, the Republican side. Sorry, Rep yeah, sorry. Go to the Republic of Ireland. Sorry, not union with no. Ireland to join the Republic. Sorry, I got my terms. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The DUP want Northern Ireland to remain part of uh, the UK, and technically it's the UK rather than Great Britain. Right. Great Britain is just the main body of England, Wales, and Scotland, and the United Kingdom includes Northern Ireland. Uh, and Sinn Fein uh, want. Northern Ireland to go back to, uh, to being a part of the Republic of, well, technically it's never part of the Republic of Ireland. Basically, they want one united island of Ireland. Community as well, who want essentially a sort of independent, or anyway, it's, it's weird. Anyway, Sinn Fein went to Downing Street and uh, came out and said that basically the British government have broken the, the, the Good Friday Agreement. Falls, which there's genuinely this potential there, and that was really the only thing that's been holding back within the Republican community. And when I say Republican, please Americans don't mistake that for what you think a Republican is. That they can, I mean, they they couldn't be further apart in the political spectrum, really. Um, but anyway, it means something different. Uh, yeah, if the Good Friday Agreement falls, Sinn Fein, the political wing of that of the Republican movement, basically. Um, have no way of going to their young people and saying, stick with the process, stick with peace. Because they tried that, they signed the Good Friday Agreement, they had power sharing in Northern Ireland, things seemed to be going really well. That stumbled. Uh, there's no power sharing agreement in the Stormont Parliament anymore. If the Good Friday Agreement then falls, there's no way they can hold back that tide of young, disaffected Republicans. And you could see a return to violence. Now, do I think it's going to go as bad as the Troubles? It doesn't look that way. I think there's been enough economic investment in Northern Ireland where a lot of the social elements of that that underpinned the Troubles aren't there. And the legal um, impingements upon Catholics isn't in place anymore. There's been equality legislation and so on and so forth. So that, that um, frustration isn't there. But could you see a return to genuine violence on the streets in Northern Ireland? Absolutely, you could. So fundamentally um, selfish about what Theresa May is doing because she isn't even doing this. She's not doing this for the good of the country. She's not even doing it for the good of the Tory party. She's doing it for the good of Theresa May. Just a prop up her government. Rather than accepting she's been embarrassed and resigning as she should because she's clearly, she's gone to the country looking for a massive mandate and has been given essentially a, a slap in the face with a wet fish. Uh, she got more votes, she got more seats, she's got the right to form a government. But this government is shaky as fuck and is threatening to potentially bring 
terrorism back to the streets of Britain from from non-Muslims. I mean, I know we had obviously Muslim attacks and all the rest of it, but uh, the Catholic and Protestant terrorists could very well kick off again because of this nonsense. And then it's not it, this isn't just pie in the sky because one of the demands of the of the Orange Order, who are essentially a sort of a fucking borderline terrorist group in Northern Ireland, who are unionist, uh, allied to the DUP. One of the things they tried to get the DUP to get in this negotiation, and it's impossible to know whether they have, I certainly hope they haven't gotten this, is that they want the um, oh, Drum Cree March or whatever it's called. But they, the series of very, very controversial marches through Republican areas by unionists, and they want the British government to guarantee that that march will go ahead. And it hasn't for about 10 years now, um, but they want it to go ahead. Can and you explain the ahead, meaning of that? that ah, right. right, yes. Yeah. Um, it's marching through what was um, a, a loyalist area a long time ago. And it's essentially um, a, a celebration of when, uh, uh, I think it's William of Orange, uh, the Dutch leader, who became, I think, King of England a long time ago, uh, slaughtered lots of Irish people and actually slaughtered what were Tories they were actually conservatives um, in Ireland uh, the Catholic conservatives um, hundreds of years ago and this is a celebration of or one of the celebrations of that and many of the marches still take place they'll go through unionist areas but various of them um, like the Falls Road and so on and so forth uh, go through Republican areas and when they do when they used to like I remember as a child it was always on the news every summer these fucking marches would go on and it would spark terrorist outrages, bombings, kneecappings, murders, left, right and centre, because it's a direct provocation, basically. The, the continuance of these marches is a direct provocation in Northern Ireland, because you're basically celebrating the murder of their ancestors. This is for fuck's sake. Uh, and so, thankfully, under the power sharing and all the rest, a lot of those most controversial marches have now been stopped. And they want the most controversial one reinstated and if that happens Northern Ireland's going to go up in flames but that's not me that's not conjecture on my part that is a fact deed fact so I do hope that the British government went no we can give you certain I hope in place of that uh, austerity or not I hope they I don't mind them giving them money so much because at least that's going to you know British citizens or whatever um, but if they give them that yeah you're going to see a return to IRA terrorism. Because the only thing holding back young Republicans from getting involved in terrorism has been, look, the political process is working. We're getting with this progress being made. Um, we can do things peacefully. Change can happen peacefully. But once, peace, once that stops, you've got no argument to go back to your people with. And if you don't, uh, the, the old uh, John Kennedy line, I think, is appropriate that those that make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. Mm. True. And that, that's what's being risked here, all for the sake of propping up Theresa May. Well, I think that's analysis of the situation, Kevin. Thanks. And all over a pint as well. Yes. Yeah. I, I, apologies for it being a bit. Um, uh, be but given the political situation and the social yeah. situation in Britain right now it does feel rather like a tinderbox waiting to go up in flames and that's that's not nice because even even when Theresa May was Prime Minister before the election you kind of felt there was a stability there and now that's totally obliterated and that's not nice. I mean, I don't. I, I obviously don't want her to be prime minister. But if she's going to be prime minister, I prefer things to be calm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, um, look at who we have in the White House. So, yeah. Some. But yes, um, America. America is a very strange place because it seems so obvious from as an outsider that some really fucked up collusion with foreign powers has gone on here. Yeah, and it yet, just keeps going. Yeah. And not just that, but the Philando Castile thing, that's ridiculous. I don't know if you've been following the... the, the yeah, the, um, I saw the, the result. The, the guy who killed. Yeah. You think, um, how many I know they're people are the police just about to kill with impunity? I don't understand this. That's, I mean, that's the thing. In Britain, I'm so glad the police don't have guns, because A, fewer people get shot, and B, the police 
and civilian relationship is so much better because it's calm because you don't you know when you interact with a police officer that it doesn't matter how hairy it gets the best he can do is beat you up and the thing is you can't get away with beating someone up because there's no excuse there's no oh i just pulled the trigger it's pretty obvious that you've gone out of your way to beat someone up you can't do that you were kind of oh i got itchy trigger finger i was scared he was he looked menacing and they use all the same excuses and they always get away with it and it's so honestly, obvious there's a racial element to it sorry yeah go on sorry go on. no i just i honestly don't know what it takes to get an officer convicted of murder when it's so obvious i think the one uh guy who when the guy um when the black man was running away from him and he shot him in the back did but honestly i can't think of any other officers that have actually been held to account when they've killed a civilian and if you've killed a civilian especially while arresting them it seems to me you failed at your at your job because their job is to protect and serve and if that means protecting us from you then that's part of your job. You know, there are ways to de-escalate situations. And uh, American police could learn a lot from British police and other European forces that engage in de-escalation. And they're confronting somebody, and the situation starts, as you said, you know, to get a bit larry. Hmm, exactly. And it's, I mean, I understand that in America because the civilians have guns, the police have guns. But, I mean, uh, firstly, pass some reasonable anti-gun or not even anti-gun just reasonable legislation like difficult to feel sorry for scalise the the guy who got shot the gop lawmaker because you think you voted for the law that allowed mentally ill people to have guns and then you get shot by a mentally ill guy you i mean you literally were asking for that you literally voted for that well, I don't like think I, very, was, I, I would quibble with the wording. I don't think he was asking for it, but what he was doing was allowing it to happen. He was allowing it for more people, and those people included himself. But it's, he, I don't think asking exactly, for it. Exactly, that's the thing. He voted. Right no, thing. well, I, well, he he voted for it, knowing that it's going to happen to Americans, and as an American, he it happened to him. Yes. I'm sorry, that's on, that's on you at that point. I find it very difficult to feel any sympathy for the guy. Now, I don't want anyone being fucking shot, which is partly why I support very strong gun legislation. Um, but I, and I realise that that's not really possible in America. But surely not allowing people who are very, very obviously unstable to have guns, doing like background checks, just really simple shit, could save well, lives. And well, they just they're in the pocket of the NRA. It's really right. yeah. And part of the reason why the laws don't work is because Congress underfunds the agencies and the programs that are meant to do background check registration where you link up state, local, and federal information on a single person. I mean, that takes a lot of coordination of information to make sure you got the person's name right. Um, and so they defund those things so they don't work so people can get guns because they can't get the information right. The other thing, too, if, you know, there's a common thread that a, a news article pointed out about people who engage in these mass shootings, these sort of middle-aged white guys who end up going on killing sprees, and one of the patterns is domestic violence. And if people, men or women, were not allowed to have a gun if they were charged um, in found guilty of domestic abuse or violence or hitting their kids or anything else, then that's another way of legally getting the hands out of people who are too violent to be trusted with a weapon. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah. Convicted of a violent crime. Oh, but the thing, too, I wanted to say was what really annoyed me was Congress's reply to this incident seemed to be to say, oh, we need to get more security around the Capitol and maybe not gather in groups so much, as opposed to taking guns off the street. They're like, we're going to turn ourselves into a gated community. Yeah. And we're going to protect ourselves. I especially loved... We're not going to fix the problem. I love uh, Ted Nugent coming out <sighs> saying we need to de-escalate the violent rhetoric toward politicians. And About nothing, time. We spent the years under Obama basically hoping he would get killed. Yeah. Fuck you. And now he wants to de-escalate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fuck, fuck you, people, man. Well, I mean, it's a step in the right direction, but the timing is suspicious. Well, exactly, because imagine, okay, in a couple of years' time, about three years' time, whatever, um, whoever, Democrat gets in, correct? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think he might return to his 
spirit towards politicians? Because I imagine he probably will. Well, if he keeps um, his if he keeps his pledge and he keeps his mouth shut, at least he won't be the focus uh, for celebrations of comments by people on the internet. He'll deny them the content for the memes that they're looking for. Yeah, but we'll we'll wait and see. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I, I think I think we've expended as much light as we go into. So I think unless you've got anything further to say on any of the issues we've discussed, this might be a no, good unless point you to, to break. Unless you wanted to gossip about Kraut, but we can do that off air too. <laughs> Just to the flame out of him on Twitter. Okay, well, yeah, if, you, if you've got some Kraut stuff you want to reveal in public, by all means. Well, it's not really revealing anything so much as that, you know, he got kicked off of Twitter because a lot of things, but one of them included making fake tweets and attributing them to curiosity of all people. Um, yeah. Having her depicting her saying terrible things, um, that and a few other things might have got him kicked off of Twitter. And so he reappeared yeah. about two weeks ago, and, and he was such yeah. a lull cow. He's gone and he's gone already gone within 10 Ridiculous. days. He's already yeah. gotten booted up, not just suspended, but like kicked off. Yeah, yeah. I, I gave him a month. I said a month and he'll be gone. <laughs> and he didn't even last two fucking weeks. Ridiculous. Yeah. And, and if you want to see why, oh, I just, I had a, I did capture some of his more bizarre things because I just started a little hashtag, uh, hashtag Kraut tweet regrets. So if you want to see some of the things that got him kicked off within 10 days, check out hashtag Kraut T tweet regrets. <laughs> yeah, he's it's so bizarre. Uh, you, know, you know he's going over the edge because the other day, right, I uh, I was on Twitter, just I think it was like two days before he got re-banned for the millionth fucking time. And uh, I got dead early in the morning. Lucky, obviously, you, he lives in Austria, you live in Germany. So it's, basically, he's an hour behind me. And so I got up dead early in the morning and crowded message me no sorry i messaged him in the morning uh, about uh, the death of bob whitaker who's the guy who came up with the white genocide mantra uh you might you might have heard of the mantra and this is the thing you have the um uh, africa for the africans asia for the asians uh, white countries for everyone white genocide thing he was the start of that <laughs> okay um, all right oh, he had a heart attack didn't he yeah and he and he died yeah a couple of days ago and so I tweeted uh, to Crow, just to, just to poke him gently. Um, I'm sorry that your Lord and Saviour died with a link to the story saying, you know, Bob Whitaker had died. Um, because Crow is essentially a fucking Nazi at this point. I, th I think there's very, again, I'm happy to say that. And if he wants to try and sue me, I could just bring up the tweets of him saying he hopes as many Muslims as possible get killed. Like it's pretty fucking cut and dried. He's a right wing ultra fucking far right piece of shit. I don't, give a, I don't give a fuck what you think about tax codes, you prick. You're far right, okay? Um, damn. Dead early in the morning. And he then spent the next 20 fucking hours, literally, the next 20 hours messaging me, Tom Bloke, uh, Sean and Jen, <laughs> a number of other people, for literally for 20 fucking hours, almost unbroken. I went through, I went through all of his tweets. And it was every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, he was tweeting this person, that person trying to get me to admit that I'd been involved in a doxing thing that I wasn't involved in that what? happened two fucking that happened two years ago and that the guy he accused me of doxing and trying to um, uh, extort money from or something had thanked me for my actions in the original event underneath that one hour live stream uh, the one hour video that Kraut did the conspiracy theory shit about how the SJWs are all evil the guy that Kraut was trying to say I doxed and, and tried to extort money from thanked me in a comment, uh, in reply to my comment under that video, thanked me for my involvement in that thing. And then two weeks later, Kraut, in this 20-hour long binge of madness, was still trying to get me to admit that I doxed this guy, even though the guy had thanked me for my role in the thing. And I don't even remember any of this because it happened two fucking years ago. But the guy himself clearly didn't think I doxed yeah. him and didn't, wasn't, but anyway... And so for 20 hours, he was on this fucking rant because I jokingly said that Bob Whitaker was his, God, was his Lord and Saviour. And you think, you've got, at that point, you've, you've moved even beyond lol cow to jumping jumping the whale on a lol cow. I mean, it's ridiculous. 
Well, I didn't provoke him. Amazing. I didn't provoke him with a, a, a sort of a, a smarty, you know, um, tweet. I, I was just being reasonable back to him, and it just seemed to infuriate him. <laughs> That's enough to yeah. set him off. But uh, one of the things that did come out of the conversation, which I'm going to be doing a video on in the next couple of days, is he's going around saying that he apologized for his yeah. participation in the um, the Google stream about um, Russian Deadpool uh, shooting Heather. Okay, and well, he, you can apologize oh, all you like, but you still mucked, you still did it. Like it's, well, I mean, how, when I asked him changed? for evidence of it, yeah, when I asked him for evidence of it, he gave me two links one to a hangout where he shows up about 50 minutes in and they talk about it, and people in the hangout try to convince him it wasn't morally wrong, in which he never says, I'm sorry, and then to a second segment of his hangout with somebody else where it's called um, I admit to a mistake or I, I made a mistake where he talks about how bad it makes him look to have said those things after he said that um, cited Thunderfoot's dad thing um, and he goes along and he never actually says the words I'm sorry he doesn't acknowledge well that's not true he doesn't acknowledge the, I'm sorry for um, his participation in the chat to anybody, let's say, who heard in the audience or friends of Heather's who were who found that disturbing and hurtful. He doesn't say that. What he does do is apologize for yelling at Baring for putting up the Russian Deadpool video, because <laughs> Baring, yes, because Baring told oh. him that that was the only and significant uh, interaction he had had with Deadpool. And that's why he put up in his channel. And so Kraut apologized to Baring for yelling at him for trying to exploit the situation. But the so, thing is... So he, okay, the only apology he made... Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. yeah. No, 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 you go ahead. Yes, let's take that part first. Because Baring yeah. lied. <laughs> we'll come to that next. Yeah, okay. I, I was just going to say, the only apology he made was to someone who also exploited yes. the death. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yes. That's. I mean, the thing is, I, I would sometimes I give people who for whom English isn't necessarily their first language the benefit of the doubt. But Kraut speaks very good English. He clearly can't misunderstand what you meant by "Have you apologised for your role in this thing?" Surely. No. Yeah. And, but if he it's thinks it's yeah. saying that he was wrong is an apology. But if I say two plus two equals five and I admit I'm wrong, that's not an apology. And he, yeah. the reasons he gave for it, I'm going to, anyway, because I asked him for his apology video, and he said, I'm, I'm not doing one on my main channel. I'm like, well, why not? If you're sorry, why wouldn't you put it on your main channel? And then I offered to say, well, show me where they are, and I'll put it together in a video, and you can circulate it. So he gave me the links. Um, but yeah, the thing is that Baring made this claim that his interaction with Russian Deadpool was the video that he showed after, after the murder took place. But the fact is, he had hung out with um, Harley in Russian Deadpool for like an hour, and then he and Russian Deadpool had a hangout after that confrontational video that he made, where they sorted it all out. Yeah, and Barry left Deadpool all of that out. Apologized for having, you know, made that confrontational video. The confrontational video that Bering then used as excuse for saying, "Oh, he's a violent maniac. Clearly, he's guilty." Before anyone knew anything. Yeah. And then put his Patreon and PayPal stuff at the end of the video. Yeah, I mean, that's um, pretty... That's but, pretty yeah, so the person that Kraut apologized to lied to him. And I've actually got... Uh, someone sent me both copies of both Hangouts, so I'm going to include that in the video, too, because it's not the only person. Someone else that was upset with Baring for putting that video up, he said, that was my last and only significant interaction with him. True. So, anyway, yeah, Kraut's, yeah. Kraut's community doesn't lie. Our community lies, except yeah, when Baring lies to him. So anyway, I wanted to just say that that's that was going to come out as a video on my channel in a few days. Yeah. Not, not just that. We don't just lie. We're criminals. That was oh, his yeah. big thing. We're criminals mm. somehow. Even though, as it was pointed out to him, uh, hate speech is illegal. And he's done plenty of that. He's the criminal, technically. Not that I would necessarily want him charged for it, because actually hate speech is sort of a weird and controversial law and all the rest of it. But if we're going to go with who has actually committed crimes here, it's you, Crow. You literally called for Muslim genocide. 
So, fuck you. But anyway, on, on that Muslim genocide note, um, <laughs> which would have been an interesting way of ending uh, an Alan Partridge yeah, episode. Um, <laughs> yeah, on that bombshell, um, I think I think we probably we probably leave it there. Thank you, Christy, for a very short notice uh, hanging out with me. Yeah, I it was say, a lot more chill than Claire. It must have been a little bit strange. Exactly. Yeah, uh, it must have been a little bit strange. But I, I feel slightly annoyed that some of our other friends haven't joined us. I have to say. <laughs> Well, probably they're just out I, I having mean, more fun on a Saturday night than either of us two old people. I don't fucking care. I don't. I, <laughs> excuses, excuses. I want. I want attendance at my behest. Anyway, I'm talking shit now. Anyway, yeah. Uh, thank you to everyone for uh, watching and listening. Thank you for Christy. It's, if we survive the coming apocalypse, I shall see you at some point in the future. Oh, some vegan okay. shitty party, or oh, some vegan shitty party, or oh, some vegan shitty con county preparation for four people. Get one and a gram of red tofu for big white mushroom. mushroom.